Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, like Patricia mentions, I work for a non-government organization that works to comprehensively combat human trafficking in the United States. Here in our New Jersey office, we work to provide comprehensive and holistic services to survivors of human trafficking. Um, it is my pleasure to be here on National Human Trafficking Awareness Day to speak on behalf of all of the survivors that we serve in our Newark-based office. I also want to thank Assemblywoman Huddle, the Coalition, the Attorney General, and every single person who's here today for showing up to learn about trafficking, to fight against trafficking, and to take steps to end trafficking in New Jersey nationally and internationally. So I was preparing for today and I was thinking, you know, how can I compile something that can do justice to the amazing women and men and young people that we serve in our office every day? And I realized at a certain point that I couldn't do that. So I asked them to do it. Um, unfortunately, I put together an audio piece for everyone to hear in the voice of the, the young women that we serve in our office today. But because of the way the speaker system is, I'm gonna be having my colleagues read their statements for us. But just to give you a little bit of context and why I think it's important for us to bring survivor voices to the forefront of experiences like this, is they are the best advocates. They have the first-hand information, and we forget sometimes how amazingly resilient, passionate, smart, funny, and human they are. I often say that I have the best job in the world because I get to work with them every single day. So my hope today is to bring a little bit of that flavor and passion and resiliency and absolute resolve to you through their words. I spoke with three different women in preparation for this event who have been longtime clients of Polaris Project, Sandra, Luisa, and Rachel. Sandra was brought to the US from Africa under the guise that she would be working in a school, she would be working and going to school once she arrived. This is a very common story that we heard. And for Sandra, a young girl with this promise was a dream come true. She saw brightness for her future. She was ecstatic. But when she got off the plane in Newark, that was not the life that she came into. She came into 18 hours a day, working without pay, extensive mental and physical abuse, and incredible and severe isolation that many of us cannot even fathom. Luisa, who I'll be sharing with you in just a few minutes, was brought from Honduras to the United States by who she thought was her boyfriend. It was someone she met who said how much he loved her and that if they wanted to provide a better life for her children, they needed to come to the United States. When they got to New Jersey, the entire situation for her changed. Everything that she believed, the love that she had for this person, the trust that she had for this person, then ended up being the person who put her into a residential brothel where she was forced to have sex with 30 men a day. And instead of receiving money, she received poker chips to give back to her traffickers to ensure they were paid her money properly. These are the situations that are happening every day in our state. They're not invisible, they're right out in the open. And the more we talk about it, the more we can do about it. The third wonderful and amazing woman that I want to introduce and give a little context to is Rachel. Rachel was born right here in New Jersey. You know, we think sometimes that these are people being brought into our state. No, 50% of the individuals we serve in our office are U.S. citizens, most of them born, raised, trafficked, and reintegrated right here in New Jersey. They never leave. Now, Rachel experienced sexual abuse from the time she was five years old, from the people who were supposed to protect her, the people who were supposed to love her unconditionally and help her flourish in this world. So by the time she was 14 years old, she's already been five or six foster homes, bounced around, kind of feels like there's no one left to trust. When a 32-year-old approaches her on the street after she's had a particularly bad fight with her foster mom and says, my God, you're so beautiful. What are you doing out here? Let's go shopping. Let's go to dinner. Let me hear a little bit more about you. I want to know who you are. She's never heard this before. Rachel has never had anyone who expressed this kind of care and interest and actual attention in her entire life. And this is extremely powerful. And this is the beginning of where we see psychological bonds happening with pimps. So this particular individual was a pimp. And after he got to know Rachel, he said, look, if we want a better life, you're gonna need to start working if we're ever gonna get out of this area. Now keep in mind, Rachel is 14 years old. She doesn't know what love is. She's had no positive examples or modeling within her families of what appropriate relationships are. And she thinks, I love this person. And he says, you need to go work in a strip club. That's how we're gonna start. I've had a couple of girls do it. 
And we see this as a common grooming ground for young girls in our state with go-go clubs galore through the 1-9 all the way up north. And that's where it started. And then a quota was instituted into her daily life. You need to bring home $3,000 a night or you're going to be beaten. You're going to be starved. And you're in an isolated situation where you have no one who cares about you and no family. So instead of going to school and having friends and learning about what Rachel wanted her life to look like, she spent her adolescence on Backpage, on Craigslist, in our casinos, and on our streets. So with that, I want to talk a little bit, or share a little bit, of their voices when I sat down with them and I asked them, what is it that you want us to know in New Jersey on National Human Trafficking Awareness Day about human trafficking? And this is what they had to say. Speaking for Sandra is Ulana Tatenchak from our Polaris office. I am from Africa and I was brought to New Jersey to go to school. After I came to New Jersey, I did not do what I was supposed to do. I started working without pay and was in a bad situation. I was abused physically and mentally. After Polaris Project found me, I am so happy. I eat, I drink, I go to school, and I have friends. This is what I want you to know. Trafficking is bad because it hurts people. It makes you feel like you are not a person. It makes you scared and neglected. We need to stop trafficking. If you cannot help people in the situation, you should know that there are victims. We need to bring traffickers to justice. Speaking for Luisa is Crystal Solorio from our Polaris Project office. We must break the silence and hold the criminals accountable, that they receive the punishment they deserve. Polaris Project has helped me and can help you too. Wherever you are, in a small corner somewhere, thinking that no one is there to help you, remember that you are not alone. You are not alone. And speaking for our Rachel is Tanisha Bowens from our Washington, D.C. office. I think human trafficking, just like violence against women, is something a lot of people are afraid to talk about. What kind of message are we sending to our sons and daughters, our cousins, nieces, and nephews, if we pretend this does not exist right here in America? We get so comfortable talking about what happens in other countries as if we are exempt, but not speaking up, not acknowledging the issue. Not acknowledging this issue makes your hands just as unclean as the traffickers who destroy so many lives of women and youth right here in the United States. Why wait until you become a victim or your daughter becomes a victim? Why, what are you afraid of? Sweeping this under the rug will not make this disappear. What happened to liberty and justice for all? I speak up for the victims who didn't make it, for the ones who aren't strong like me. We don't all get a happy ending. Can we come together to fight human trafficking, please? The same way we come together for breast cancer and child abuse and American Idol. Be a true American Idol by contributing to our efforts to end human trafficking, because the numbers will continue to go up as long as we continue to stay silent. Apart from what you just heard and the amazingly powerful stories from these three courageous young women, Sandra also wanted you to know that she loves bunnies, that she wants to be a nurse, and that her favorite color is pink. Louisa wanted to share that the things she's most proud of are her three beautiful children, that she loves reggae music, and that she loves to dance. And Rachel wanted to say that her favorite show is Project Runway. She loves to write poetry and anything with bow ties. So often when we talk about trafficking and survivors, it's to recount stories of abuse or relive exploitation. But when we fail to see that survivors are members of our community, our family, our religious groups, and our friends, we forget that this is an issue affecting people right here in New Jersey. We make survivors, in essence, the other. People that aren't like us, but they are. They're in our communities, and I guarantee each and every one of you has met a survivor of human trafficking, even if you didn't know it. So the women you just heard from were trafficked right here in New Jersey, and we need to keep their voices at the forefront of awareness and make sure that we're advocating for legislation to protect them 
allocating resources to focus on rebuilding and empowering these individuals' lives that have been so thoroughly affected by trafficking. But to do that, we need to talk about human trafficking. Like Patricia mentioned, the education part is crucial. The awareness is crucial, but then we need to educate others. We need to come up with a plan on how we're gonna stop this. And a great way to do that is to reach out to the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. And that's the number that Patricia mentioned earlier. And I'm gonna say it one more time. If any of you wanna pop out your cell phones and save it, that would be great. If not, we have materials inside with the number. And that is 888-373-8833. Eight, eight, eight. Well, I don't even need to tell you because you've already got it. <laughs> Another thing that I always like to mention is we need to get our language in check. How we talk about things and the language and vocabulary that we use to describe it has everything to do with how we understand, view, and combat these problems. So when we're talking about children who've been forced into the commercial sex industry, we need to call that what it is. It's a commercially sexually exploited youth that is not a child prostitute. When we're talking about individuals who are coming out of pimp control, and we also use the word pimp to say, wow, that's pimpin', his sneakers look so good, they're so pimpin', you know, Brad Pitt's a pimp because he has so many ladies. What are we really saying? We're talking about traffickers, individuals who use the most cruel, unusually violent, and incredibly abusive practices to recruit and keep women under their control. So you can do one thing today, and that is to think about pimp culture in our society today and what it means and how it allows individuals to operate in this way with a lot of social acceptance. And the last thing, we need to make sure that we're supporting the survivors that are out there and bringing their voices in individual ways and diverse ways. Survivors don't just need to be invited to tell their stories and relive their trauma. They have opinions, they have strong thoughts about advocacy, legislation, and they needed to be invited to these conversations throughout what we move forward and whatever plan we're making, they need to be a part of it. So as community members, as lawmakers, as a coalition, as you know, social service agencies, we have a lot of power and a tremendous amount of pressure to change the world that we live in. And I am inspired, truly inspired every day by the women, men, and young people that we work with. And through that, I truly do believe that we can come together for a world without slavery. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, and uh, I promise I will be brief, but I will be complete. Um, this one? Okay. Hi, um, my name is Ingrid Johnson. I'm a registered nurse representing Overlook Medical Center, a member of Atlantic Health System, and I'm um, on the New Jersey Coalition Against Human Trafficking. Uh, first, I would like to thank all of the many legislative supporters of laws aimed at addressing the trafficking of persons in our nation and in the state of New Jersey. My family, victims, and survivors around the world appreciate your support and thank you for joining us at our nation's first Human Trafficking Awareness Day rally. Nine years ago, human trafficking victims and survivors were poorly misunderstood and domestic victims born and raised in the United States were not included in discussions or laws. Today, I am personally overjoyed that the world is listening and seeking awareness about this devastating issue traumatizing men, women, and children of all nationalities and races. In 2004, my oldest of three children and only daughter was a habitual runaway. Like a lot of teens, she pushed the limits and gave into peer pressure as she sought acceptance from others. She was an honor roll student at the top of her class played the violin and attended one of the best public elementary and private middle schools in our area. My daughter ran away from our home, which was located in Irvington, New Jersey, and was missing for 11 months. This was after other stints of running away. Upon her return, she was said to have been the only missing child during the 11th month period who returned home alive. As all of her incidents had been reported to local authorities, I contacted and worked closely with local law enforcement, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, walked the streets of Irvington and Newark posting flyers, and called community service organizations to see if anyone had seen my child. New Jersey State Police Detective Wanda Sajanoff, who's here with me today, um, I don't want to embarrass you, Wanda, but she is here, 
um, played a huge part in my daughter's recovery. Um, and she's joined by a fellow officer. And Wanda, I, I just can't thank you enough. Initially, my efforts seemed hopeless until one day, while I was working as a night nurse in Newark, my cell phone rang at the end of my shift. I missed the call and began to play the voicemail message as I walked down the hallway on my way home. It was my daughter crying, Mommy, I miss you, and Mommy, I love you. Little did I know that at that time, my daughter had snuck away to hide in a gas station bathroom to call home while fearing for her life. My body became lifeless, and someone helped me return to my nursing unit to gain my composure. You see, I had kept this issue a secret the entire time due to the shame and stigma placed on a good parent dealing with a heartbreaking issue. I immediately went to the Irvington police to report the call. They followed up and requested a subpoena of my phone records. Unfortunately, I had to return home empty-handed with no answers. Then one day while on vacation, I was working with Detective Stajanov, and we received a break in the cake. My daughter's call had been traced to a phone tower in New York. Immediately, my family and I packed up from vacation, and I made my way to New York a police precinct in the vicinity of the call to post flyers. It was there that I learned that my daughter had been forced into prostitution. It took several trips to New York, but with the support from the New York Police Department, and after hours of waiting outside a New York train station with police and unmarked cars, I recovered her. Underneath a wig and with mental and physical scars was my 14, soon to be 15 year old little girl. She has been home ever since and well on her, way, well on her road to recovery and she's here with us today. This is my daughter. <laughs> Thank you. This is my youngest child, <laughs> Christian, who's nine, and he was just born when she was left. When she left, he was only a few months old. And this is my grandbaby now, Tiamba's daughter. So we're here as a family with you today. Thank you. Now today, she stands with us as a survivor of human trafficking, a junior in college and mother strengthened by her God and the love, prayers, and support of our family and friends. Our journey was lonely, full of doubt, near-death experiences, but thank God we made it. We continue to encourage victims and survivors to never give up hope, for you are not alone. We stand here today as an example that if you dig deep, you can still find your well of faith, hope, determination, and courage to go on, even when it seems as if the lights are out. Be ye encouraged, knowing that you can become a rose and bloom again. Know that you never walk alone, and that our nation and our state are paving the way for increasing opportunities for you to regain your freedom and your life. The passage of the resolutions that you've heard of today, and the Prevention, Protection, and Treatment Act, all which are New Jersey bills, will bring hope to the hopeless and send a message to New Jersey's victims of human trafficking that freedom is in the air and that help that will lead them to a brighter future is on the way. New Jersey, don't give up on our children. They simply don't have the mental capacity to decide that they want to become a victim or a prostitute. Instead, support legislation that helps to educate, provide services, and protect our children and our communities. Remember that some of our homeless and adults struggling with addiction issues were once children who fell through the cracks when help was unavailable. Lastly, it is imperative that healthcare workers like myself become knowledgeable about this group of vulnerable persons. While missing and with her name in a national missing persons database and with her picture posted all around our country, including on Channel 7's missing person segment, have you seen? My teenage daughter had been arrested and released for prostitution, received medical treatment, and still remained missing. Know that victims are truly in plain sight waiting for us to provide them with a safe passage home. Please join me for a moment of silence followed by song in honor of all, because we're just representing domestic victims. There are other forms of victimization that were discussed here today, and we don't want to leave them out. Uh, and so we're including some who have lost their lives, survivors who are free, and victims in search of freedom and life restoration. So please, a moment of silence.
Thank you. And now I'm going to follow by song to conclude. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of a storm, there's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a love. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, though your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart. And you'll never walk alone. You'll never walk alone. Thank you. God bless.